Good evening. You're watching Scotland at 7. I'm Hugh Stewart. Uh, tonight, we're going to begin, as usual, with the coronavirus update for Scotland. As of 2pm today, a total of 3,404,007 people in Scotland have been tested through the NHS Scotland Labs and the UK Government Regional Testing Centres since the start of the pandemic. Of these, 2,766,000 741 have been confirmed negative and 637,266 have tested positive. There are 2,732 new cases of COVID-19 confirmed by a test, although not everyone with the virus will display symptoms and not all those, tested, uh, not all those with symptoms will be tested. There are 24 new reported deaths of people who have tested positive. The number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus infection now stands at 9,143. This number only includes those who have died having received a positive test for the virus in the previous 28 days. Of the people who have tested positive, 926 were in hospital last night, 60 of whom were in intensive care. As of 8am this morning, 4,314,144 people have received their first dose of the COVID-19 vaccination and 3,903,299 have received their second dose. The latest UK figures show 140,392 patients who had tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness an increase of 186 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings, not just hospitals. Torrential downpours overnight have caused flooding and disruption in the south of Scotland and in England and Wales from Cumbria down to Cornwall, with multiple flood warnings in place as heavy rain continued. The Met Office has issued yellow weather, yellow weather warnings across southwest Scotland, northwest England, North Wales and southern parts of England with heavy rain in places and a risk of localised flooding. Homes were flooded after heavy downpours hit Dumfries and Galloway. In Annan, the Cuthbertson and Diamond Jubilee bridges collapsed and were swept away as the River Annan rose yesterday evening. Conditions led to the closure of schools as well as travel disruption in the south and west of Scotland. Network Rail Scotland were concerned about the railway viaduct over the River Annan on the Dumfries to Carlisle line, which was closed earlier today while the bridge was inspected for structural damage. The flooding has caused significant delays on train lines and affected services running to Glasgow before the COP26 climate summit, and Avanti West Coast has advised passengers against travelling north of Preston. Avanti and Tra Tra TransPennine Express services face speed restrictions for safety. A major incident was declared in Hoyke in the Scottish borders on Thursday night with fears that up to 500 properties could be affected by flooding. Officers in Hoyke called the borders water rescue team, the mountain rescue and the fire crews to help evacuate properties as schools and health, health centres were closed. The rest centre at Teviot Dale Leisure Centre was reopened to offer assistance to anyone displaced, displaced by the risk of flooding. Following reports that a Scottish scallop trawler has been seized in France amidst the row between the UK and French governments over fishing rights, the SNP has said it is a disgrace that the Scottish fishing industry is set to pay the price again for the UK government's hard Brexit deal. The SNP's DEFRA spokesperson Deirdre Brock, MP, demanded answers in an urgent question yesterday and has urged the UK government to fix the problem it created. Commenting, Deirdre Brock said, This is another example of the UK government seeking a dispute with France and Scotland paying the price. The Scottish fishing industry should not be collateral in the row between the UK and French governments consequence of Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for. Ms Brock said it's another kick in the teeth for fishers after being sold out by the UK Tory government in the Trade and Cooperation Agreement. 
Tories guaranteed a sea of opportunity following Brexit, but all we have is a slough of despond. The UK government has had well over 40 hours to get to the bottom of the issue after this poor crew were arrested, yet ministers are still claiming ignorance of the cause and nothing has been resolved. The SNP has condemned the UK government's post-Brexit race to the bottom in standards after reports that the former International Trade Secretary Liz Truss blocked plans to, imp to ban imports made to low animal welfare standards. The rejected proposals would have made it easier for the UK government to ban products which fell short of standards, including beef from cows kept in confined spaces or eggs from hegs hens caged in dire conditions. According to reports, Liz Truss, who is now Foreign Secretary, blocked pan plans to maintain high standards as it would have hampered the Tory government's attempts to secure post-Brexit trade deals. Commenting, the SNP's shadow international trade spokesperson Drew Henry MP said, If these reports are true, then it confirms once again that the Tory government is intent on sacrificing our high standards and selling out our food and farming sectors in fire scale like fashion, fire sale like fashion, in order to secure damaging post Brexit trade deals. Mr. Henry added, the UK Australia trade deal has already raised serious concerns, with Scotland's agricultural sector facing the very real threat of being undercut on standards and prices. Reports that the former trade secretary blocked measures to ban imports of low standard products have only heightened those concerns with future trade deals as the Tory government pursues a race to the bottom in standards. The BBC is to appoint external inv inv invigilators to assess the impartiality of its coverage of contentious topics. The Corporation's Director General, Tim Davey, announced today that the BBC's entire output including children's programme, documentaries and educational material, will in the future be constantly analysed for any impartiality breaches as a part of a series of rolling external investigations. Programme makers in all areas of the BBC's output, not just the news division, will be required to show that they are representing a broad range of ideologies and voices in their content. This means everything from CBBS to BBC Sport, and the corporation's social media accounts, is likely to be scrutinised to make sure it is reflecting a variety of viewpoints. Each imparti impartiality review will have an externally appointed chair and will seek evidence from the public and interested organisations on how the BBC covers a particularly contentious national topic, giving lobby groups an opportunity to formally attempt to influence the broadcaster's editorial line. The choice of external individuals to lead, to lead each review and whether they have any political connections is likely to come under intense scrutiny given the government's willingness to push its own preferred candidates for cultural appointments. Ministers are already taking an active interest in who the corporation will appoint as the new head of news and potential replacement for Laura Koonsberg as political editor. The first review will look at how the BBC reports on UK public spending and taxation. How the corporation frames this topic is highly contentious. On Wednesday, the main BBC News Twitter account deleted a post stating that Chancellor Richie Sunak now has to balance the books because he borrowed heavily during the pandemic amidst complaints that the broadcaster was effectively endorsing the government's arguments on public spending. BBC journalists are already speculating as to which other contentious topic areas are likely to be the subject of future external impartiality reviews. We will wait to see when and how impartiality in BBC Scotland is dealt with, but we probably won't be holding our breath. The Guardian reports that asylum seekers are being housed by the Home Office in a former courthouse turned hostel, which promised Nights in a, with, with promised nights in an authentic prison cell to backpackers. The facility, which uh, appears to have been a form of court 
and prison cell theme park backpacker accommodation has been used to house hundreds of people, including some who were imprisoned in the past in their home countries, including Libya. They have said that the experience of being locked up uh, in the UK in the prison cell-like conditions has traumatised them again. The Guardian did not identify the facility after a spate of attacks by the far right on accommodation for asylum seekers and refugees. The hostel was previously a courthouse with a prison cell wing and has preserved many of the penal facilities, including cell windows and heavy old-fashioned cell doors, complete with keys and prison-style bunk beds. The hostel, whose website includes the phrase Sleep in an authentic prison cell, has a mix of dormitories and smaller rooms, including the former prison cells. The Home Office has said asylum seekers are staying in regular hotel accommodation and part of rebuilding with experienced rooms is not accessible. Psychology experts have found that asylum seekers housed in military barracks accommodation such as Napier and Folkestone by the Home Office have been re-traumatised by the military surroundings, having fled military regimes or police or army violence. While the use of old prison, the old prison wing was intended to provide light-hearted interest and history for the backpackers who stayed there before the Home Office took over the site, the wing has a very different resonance for traumatised asylum seekers. The European Football Association, UEFA, ordered the, uh, Union Berlin to close part of their stadium for the next European fixture due to racist behaviour of their fans during a Europa Conference League match last month. UEFA said the incident took place during Union Berlin's 3-0 group stage victory over Israeli club Maccabi Haifa at the Olympic Stadion Berlin on the 30th of September. In addition to the closure of two sectors where home fans sit, the governing body also ordered Union Berlin to display a banner with the wording hashtag no to racism in the next home UEFA competition game, which will be against Feyenoord in the Europa Conference League, 4th of November. Finance and health ministers from the world's, the world's 20 biggest economies, the G20, announced today that they would take steps to ensure 70% of the world's population is vaccinated against COVID-19 by mid-22, and they have created a task force to fight future pandemics. They could not reach an agreement on a separate financing facility proposed by the United States and Indonesia, but said the task force would, would explore options for mobilising funds to boost pandemic preparedness, preparation and response. Previously, the goal had been to vaccinate 70% of the world's population by the autumn of 2022. The ministers said that they were setting up a new body because the COVID-19 pandemic had exposed significant shortcomings in the world's, the world's ability to coordinate its response. They pledged to support all collaborative efforts to provide access to safe, affordable, quality and effective vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics and personal protection equipment, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. To reach the vaccination goals, they said they would work to boost the supply of vaccines and essential medical products and inputs in developing countries, while removing constraints on supply and financing, but gave no specific details. They also called for boosting the resilience of supply chains through voluntary technology transfer hubs in various regions, such as the newly established mRNA hubs in South Africa, Brazil and Argentina, through joint production and processing arrangements. In Rome today, President Joe Biden praised Pope Francis for his leadership on urging climate action and greater distribution of coronavirus vaccines around the world. During a longer-than-expected meeting at the Vatican, as the US President began a European trip, before the climate summit in Scotland. The Pope urged world, world leaders to take radical decisions at next week's COP26 summit, the Global Environmental Summit, in his special message broadcast on BBC Radio Today. Leaders attending the COP26 conference in Glasgow must offer concrete hope to future generations, the pontiff said. He added, 
Climate change and the COVID-19 pandemic have exposed our deep vulnerability and raised numerous doubts and concerns about our economic systems and the way we organise our societies. President Biden arrived in Rome overnight, having failed to win his own party's final agreement on his flagship leg legislative bills, despite announcing a historic economic framework before he left Washington, D.C. yesterday. The president had touted his $1.75 trillion plan to expand the nation's social safety net and confront the climate crisis, uh, although down from the original proposed $3.5 million, $3 trillion, as a victory for consensus and compromise that would make the U.S. more competitive and resilient, even as the path forward remained uncertain. He had hoped to leave the U.S. on the back of a, of a deal on his Build Back Better legislative agenda, but both moderate and progressive Democrats in Congress have yet to sign and agree the final votes, despite the urging of the President and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Both are projecting optimism that the final deal is close. President Biden will be in Glasgow to speak at the COP26 on Monday. Funding to help people struggling financially during the winter is part of a new £41 million support package. The Winter Support Fund will help those on low incomes, uh, children and people at risk of homelessness against the backdrop of rising living and fuel costs. Key elements of the package include £10 million to help people who are struggling to pay fuel bills, £25 million of flexible funding to help local authorities support well-being and respond to financial insecurity based on local needs. £6 million for third sector partners to support low-income families. Scottish Justice Secretary Shona Robertson said, We know that many families are struggling financially due to the increased costs they are facing right now. This package of measures aims to ease some of that strain by, by providing direct support to people. The Scottish Government has invested £2.5 billion to support low-income households in the year 20-21, with around £1 billion focused on supporting children as a cornerstone of our national mission to tackle child poverty and homelessness. Scotland and the rest of the UK have been formally adopted into the European Union's Digital Covid Certification Scheme, the EU DCCC scheme, the European Commission has confirmed. All COVID certificates will be recognised across Europe from Monday the 1st of November as the UK joins the EU scheme, which provides a means for QR codes to be scanned and verified as being officially issued. This change will open up ease of access for travellers to more than 40 countries covered by the certification scheme. It covers travel to Europe and those countries which like the UK, are affiliated with the European Union DCC. It will also enable better access to facilities like bars and other venues where this is required in those countries which have chosen to use the EU's DCC domestically. Users of the NHS COVID status app will have their vaccination status automatically updated when they log in. Scots travelling to the European Union and countries covered by the scheme who have downloaded a PDF version with QR codes on their mobile device, or anyone who has a printed letter with their COVID status dated before October 7th, will need to either request an app or request a new letter. Uh, thank you. Now, that's all the news we have on Broadcasting Scotland tonight. Um, so looking forward, looking forward to Broadcasting Scotland's um, programming next week. Don't forget to tune in to um, the Full Scottish on Sunday lunchtime. Uh, of course, the COP26 uh, conference begins here in Glasgow on Sunday. And so from next week and for the next two weeks, Broadcasting Scotland has an extensive pro extra programme format. We are putting together an exciting package of broadcasts from the studio and also from out in, the, in Glasgow where we'll be speaking to various visitors and locals about the COP26 conference. 
So don't forget to tune in next week to Broadcasting Scotland as well as Scotland at 7. We will have other broadcasts coming up for you. Now for all this, of course, we need your help. Broadcasting Scotland is not funded except by you, our subscribers and viewers. And if you look at the, um, the information on the screen below, if you want us to make more prog programmes and you want to help, then please consider donating, look at the website, become a subscriber, and uh, we can guarantee that every pound we receive will be spent on programming, apart from a wee bit on biscuits. Okay, so uh, please give us a hand, and we, are, we really are anxious to put more programmes out, and with your help, that's exactly what we will do. So that's it from Broadcasting Scotland tonight. So it's um, the full Scottish on Sunday and then a full two weeks of coverage of the COP26 conference here in Glasgow. I'm Hugh Stewart. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Good night. What distinguishes Broadcasting Scotland from a website or blog, apart from our brilliant programmes? Hi there, I'm Gordon Ross. Are the costs we face to enable us to produce those programmes? These costs are significant and ongoing. However, our facilities are able to do so much more if only we had the staff. In the last year, some of our supporters have cancelled their subscriptions. In one way, we would prefer it if it was because they didn't like us, rather than it being because of the financial pressures which we are all under because of COVID. The really positive outcome of our fundraiser is that at a time of economic challenge in Scotland, we will use your donations to create jobs and in a small way contribute to improving the Scottish economy. If you want us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster, able to provide an alternative mainstream television platform, then please support us. Scotland is going to be an independent country. Just imagine what we could do if we had even 1% of the BBC Scotland Channel's budget. Imagine. And then please consider turning your imagination into reality. Please support us if you can afford it.